of all, I have to thank a number of people. Eli, you're the first person I'm going to thank for hooking me up with the Sex Ed Conference and everyone who's here. Um, I have been to a lot of conferences over the course of 18 years that I've been a teacher. And I have never experienced so much exuberance and excitement from everyone in the room. Uh, we were in a dinner earlier um, that Bill had organized. And everyone was super happy and super engaging. And I thought, I think I'm going to go into sex ed. Um, <laughs> I've been an English teacher for 18 years. And um, it's funny, a lot of my students actually will say to me, you are teaching the sex ed we wish we had. Um, and it's really, that is really an honor to me because I didn't actually have a very good sex education um, in, in the mid 90s. Um, and I con don't consider myself um, necessarily trained in sex education, but I do feel very strongly about it, even though my training is really in literature, but my commitment is to social justice. So that's how I do the work of activism and change with young people. Um, so, I also want to thank Bill. I want to, I, want to, I want to thank just the Sex Ed Conference in general, the entire staff, Lorena, who's going to give some translation for me um, uh, a little bit later in the presentation. I really feel like this is a home already for me. Um, earlier, um, I'm forgetting now the, the co-chair the co who was talking about um, being a woman of color in sex ed, the sex ed field. Um, as a queer woman of color in teaching and ed education, I bring my full self to this work. And um, so often when we do this work that are bringing our full selves, you're gonna bring not only your full self, but you're also gonna experience, because of that, a lot of vulnerability and a lot of pain. And I know that in the 18 years that I've been doing this work, I too have also felt pain and vulnerability. So I, when that moment, um, I'm, tell me again, you're the co-chair's name. Tanya, Tom, when you, when you said that, I, I felt very connected to you um, because I do think as educators, we really put ourselves out there. Um, so I do have a blog called Feminist Teacher. And what, the reason why I started it was because I wanted to document the work I was doing in the classroom and to bring down the silos between those of us in the classroom those who were in academia, and those who were on the ground as activists. And I consider myself kind of have a foot in all of those particular circles. And I wanted a space where we could talk about feminist and queer and ethnic studies, ethnic studies, queer studies, gender studies, women's studies, sexuality studies, in one space where teachers could really have a kind of um, a forum to come together. And I created a hashtag called um, HS feminism high, feminism, high School Feminism. Um, and if anybody tweets tonight, please feel free to use the, the Sex Ed Conference um, hashtag. As, and if you, feel, if you feel so inclined to use my High School Feminism uh, hashtag, please feel free to do so. As well as the Safe Schools hashtag, which was started by um, the Safe Schools Action Network and Shannon Cuddle. Um, so please feel free to do that. I'm going to go to the next slide to introduce you to my work. So for the last 18 years, I've been doing feminist teacher work um, really as a literature teacher. But when I say feminist teacher work, I mean that I teach a feminism and activism class. I teach a LGBT literature class where we do talk about a lot of sex scenes that my students, I, we, I used to teach the, the novel Stonebridge Blues. How many of you have read Stonebridge Blues? Well, if you know Stonebridge Blues, you know that there are some pretty um, beautiful sex scenes in that particular novel. Um, and there's also some pretty um, violent scenes as well. And my students would say to me, Ileana, can you talk to us about these particular scenes, can you talk to us about strap-ons? Can you talk to us about you know, all the, the pleasure that this particular character is feeling? And so I think that's what my students mean when they say, we're getting the sex ed from you that we wish we had. Um, I'm gonna come back to this particular thing because for all of this time that I've been doing this teaching, um, I reached a point where I kind of needed a new challenge. 
And I think a lot of us reach this point where we want that new plateau. We want that new mountain. We want that new challenge to bring us to the next level. And I did that with a Fulbright to Mexico. And when I did that Fulbright, I decided to conduct um, interviews of LGBT youth um, in university high schools um, throughout uh, Mexico City. And when I say university high schools, what I mean by that is, is that UNAM, which is their big um, public university, kind of like a UCLA or a Berkeley, but um, more on the level of, uh, of a, a kind of Harvard or Oxford's of, of Latin America. Um, and so I was there as a guest researcher um, for about six months as a part of the Distinguished Fulbright Program, which was not a teaching Fulbright, it was a research Fulbright for teachers. Let's actually kind of think about that for a second. Teachers don't get the opportunity to do research. That's the realm of PhD students, it's the realm of uh, professors, it's the realm of academia. So for teachers to do research really is a gift and a luxury and an absolute pleasure because it brought me to the next level of my work. And in that particular project, I was able to um, work with LGBT youth in creating a safe space where they could actually share their daily experiences with me. Um, they could engage with me as kind of visionaries for how they wanted to be change agents in their school. They, I was also able to collaborate with their teachers and some of their teachers and the administrators on best practices to support LGBT youth because they were telling me themselves, these are the, um, these are the things that we want done and implemented in our school. Um, I was also able to delineate strategies with the administration. There was a lot of education that I had to do with them. Um, I, I'll tell you a story a little bit later about uh, some gender and sexuality work I had to do with them in terms of distinguishing between the two, and then also collaborating with the university. UNAM's high schools um, take a, about a hundred, over 100,000 students. Um, and I just kind of, I don't know if, the, if you know kind of how this works, but imagine if UCLA had its own high school system or if CUNY in New York had its own high school system. So these high schools are like feeders into the larger university. And this is only one system within all of Mexico's multiple systems of, of public education. So the university high schools are their like kind of own system of high schools. And I was embedded in many ways in one particular school that had over 5,000 students. Um, and of those 5,000 students, I was able to meet with 30 amazing queer and allied youth, six teachers and four administrators, and I was able to kind of really engage them in a conversation about what, what queerness is in their particular school. This is just a general breakdown of of the students that I spoke to. Most of the students were bisexual girls. And I, I saw, I noticed that tomorrow, I think uh, there's a workshop on bisexuality that I'd like to go to. Um, there were some terminology, they, they actually resisted the term bisexual. Um, the kids preferred to say um, heteroflexible or homoflexible. Um, they, they were really kind of resistant to this idea of bisexuality. They wanted a new term. They wanted new language around this. And I thought that was really um, powerful. Um, I also spoke to one transgender girl who identified as a lesbian. And I use words like lesbian um, very um, intentionally because words like queer aren't necessarily fully embraced in certain contexts in Mexico. It's seen sometimes as a colonial word. Um, and so for some students it was fine, for others it wasn't. Um, and so lesbiana, bisexual, transgenero, these were some words that were much more inclusive. Okay, so I'm gonna give you, so I'm, a, I'm an English teacher, so I'm gonna tell you a story about um, Ilian and Marion, and these, these, this was a couple. And um, a lot of the kids actually found me through kind of a snowball effect. They would knock on the door, they knew there was a crazy lady in their school who was interviewing the kids on um, LGBT issues, and they were like, wow, in our school of 5,000, 
let's go talk to her, even though she's extranjera, she's, you know, this was like a concern that I had. Um, this was the first study in all of Mexico that had ever been done on LGBT youth directly. Um, and so as someone who doesn't have a PhD, who was a teacher researcher, um, it was an honor to talk to these kids um, in a, a first-time study. So Ilian um, and Marian were our couple, or were a couple at the time. Um, Ilian is a transgender girl, and Marian is a cisgender girl, and they were a couple, and they had actually met um, before um, Ilian's transition, and they had been a couple when Ilian um, was presenting as male, and they approached me actually separately, and Ilian um, had poked her head in to the room where I was, and, and she, I didn't know at that time that she identified as she, but she had poked her head in and said, I really need to talk to you. And I said, of course, let me finish with this particular student. And she comes in and, and she says to me, I really need to talk to you because you're the only person who will understand what I'm talking about. And she proceeds to tell me her whole story of transitioning publicly at the school. Um, and then Marion also shares her story with me in terms of telling me what it's been like for her to transition with her girlfriend who was once, and in, in their particular terminology, they were both novios, right? And now they were novias. And so they, you know, they, she was talking to me about that particular transition. There's a story that they tell that I think encapsulates a lot of what I heard what I, while I was there. And it had to do with the bullying that Ilian faced due to being a transgender girl and transitioning publicly at school with 5,000 kids. And I'm gonna ask Lorena to read the Spanish. And the reason why the Spanish is on the slides, I did this on purpose. Um, I really wanted a way for the students to be here with us and, and to have the Spanish here with us. And Lorena is gonna read us the Spanish and then I'm gonna translate it into English. Um, and this is, this is a story um, about bathrooms. Me ignoraron. Me dijeron que no habían baños, que entraran los hombres o que aguantar. Me dijo el director, pues vete preparando. Te vienes en la mañana, te preparas para aguantar todo el día. Entonces fue así, porque yo le dije, me está afectando no nada más físicamente, sino mentalmente. Me puse bien mal y me sentía mal y me salí corriendo, me sentí como traicionada o sucia, no sé. Okay, thank you. They ignored me. They told me that there weren't any restrooms, that I should go to the men's room, or that I should just hold. The principal told me, well, come prepared. Come in the morning and come prepared to hold all day long. So it was just like that. And I told him, this is affecting me, not only physically, but also mentally. I started to feel very bad, and I felt bad, and I ran out crying, and I felt betrayed or dirty. I don't know. Ilian's girlfriend then shared um, another story that's connected to, and I, I'm gonna bring all of this, these quotes together in the, in the next kind of few minutes, but I want Lorena to read the, Lorena to read the next um, quote from Marion, and I'm going to bring together these two passages. Hay un niño que la molesta mucho, se burla de ella, pero así a todo lo que da. Entonces en la noche íbamos saliendo ya y pasábamos por allá afuera. Entonces se ríe, se ríe y empezó a decir, ah, que eres gay, que tienes brasier y que eres esto. Entonces, sí, a Elian se le fue así muy, 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 muy feo. Me dio miedo porque yo no sabía cómo ella iba a reaccionar y no sabía si yo lo iba a poder detener. Yo no tenía fuerza para protegerla. Eso fue lo más feo que nos ha pasado por aquí. Okay, thank you. There's a boy here at school who bothers her, Ilian, a lot. He makes fun of her, and I mean totally aggressively. One time at night, <coughs> excuse me, we were leaving school, and we were, when we left right over here, and that guy, he was laughing and laughing, and he started saying, ah, oh, you're gay, you have a bra, and all these other things. So yes, it was very, very ugly for Ilian. 
I got scared because I didn't know how Ilian was going to react. And I didn't know how I was going to hold back the guy. And I didn't have the strength to protect Ilian. That was the ugliest, worst thing that has ever happened to us here. Okay. So these, were, these two passages came about in two separate interviews. Um, and I share them with you because for Ilian, a lot of what she shared with me had to do with um, not feeling comfortable at school. And the different ways in which she felt completely kind of um, almost on, on watch, on surveillance, um, because she was transitioning. And she basically was trying to ask for a bathroom, just a separate bathroom. She didn't feel comfortable going to the girls' room. She didn't feel comfortable going to the boys' room. And there were, this is a pretty large campus, and so there were, she wanted to maybe use the faculty bathroom or use maybe a separate bathroom that wasn't used as much by other students. And the director um, had said to her, well, if I have to provide you with a bathroom, does that mean I have to provide lesbian and gay and bisexual students with bathrooms as well? And this is where kind of the education piece came in. I met with this administrator, this principal, and I said, could you tell me a little bit about the story about Ilian and the bathrooms? And, and then he kind of proceeded to tell me what I've just shared with you from his perspective. And I said to him, so there's a difference between gender and sexuality. What Ilian was asking for was not, does not pertain to, his, to her sexual identity. It has to do with her gender identity. And we proceeded into this conversation. And finally, by the end of three hours, I was with this administrator for three hours in his office, and he really came around. And I think that that's part of what teachers can do on the ground, which is to really begin to do the education of people who are perhaps in more of a power or decision-making position. Um, and I felt, I felt particularly, like as a one-time researcher, completely obligated to do something to advocate on behalf of Ilian because she was going through such a tough transition especially since uh, her parents were actually absent from her life. With Marion, the bullying piece is also an, uh, important, which is that for her, she felt completely powerless. She felt completely um, in, uh, in, unequipped to be able to deal with um, the harassment and bullying that came from Ilian's transition. Um, and uh, I think that that's also a part of what teachers should be doing in the classroom, which is supporting young people as they move through whatever life journey they're going on. So part of what the students did was they showed me their private spaces. And um, they had this space called La Banca Gay, which means the gay bench. And they, they kept, a, a number of the kids kept talking about this bench. And they said, um, I said, you know, where is this space? So they brought me to it. And it was, what was interesting was that it was actually within eye's view of the director's um, office, which I thought was kind of interesting. You'd think it would be in some hidden enclave on campus, but it was actually quite public. And what I noticed was the sense of resilience from these kids. And they said, you know, this is our space to be a, a family. Somos una familia. And this was a space where they said, you know, we have dinners for each other, we um, connect with each other, we make out with each other, we hook up, we break up. You know, they do all these things on this bench. And um, they, they, they were so eager to tell me and show me this bench. And I, and I was, again, honored to, to, to be a part of their space, because usually teachers are not invited into student spaces, right? Um, but they were, they were very, very eager to have me see this gay bench. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little story um, of just one about a sex education class that I kept hearing about over and over again, and I thought it would be um, relevant to this audience. El profesor de la educación de la salud, en cual al dar el tema de los aparatos reproductores femenino y masculino, empezó a sacar temas y dijo, los homosexuales tienen un problema, 
son una aberración, porque el pene del hombre está hecho para la vagina de la mujer, nada más, que era un problema psicológico. Me sentí mal, porque no es una aberración. Nadie le dio risa, porque en mi grupo todos somos muy abiertos a los temas. The health education teacher. When he taught us about the female and male reproductive system, he started to say things like, homosexuals have a problem. They are an aberration because the man's penis is made to fit into a woman's vagina. That's it. It's a psychological problem. I felt bad because it's not an aberration, and no one laughed at what he said, because in my group of friends, we are very open about these issues. This is from Alfredo, who um, identified as a young gay male, and he was sharing with me a story that I actually wound up hearing a number of times, not only from the queer students, the LGBT students, but also from straight students. So I actually had a, a small sampling of straight students who told me about this same sex educator or health teacher, um, and I thought that the pattern was very indicative of the kind of, um, kind of yearning that they wanted a different kind of climate in their classroom. They wanted a climate where LGBT issues could be talk, talked about in a much more inclusive way related to sexuality, related to gender, related to health. Um, and they kept sharing this story with me over and over again, I think because they wanted me to say something, to do something, to intervene on their behalf. Um, so as someone who's not a sex educator, I strongly believe in what Gloria uh, Carriaga says. Uh, she, I don't know if you know who she is, but she's a very well-known um, feminist activist um, in Mexico, but also she's the secretary general, co-secretary general of ILGA, which stands for International Lesbian and Gay Association. And one of the things she's, she's written about is that the role of teachers and administrators is to respect and protect the sexual lives of their students. And I think this is actually something really relevant for someone like myself, which is all of you are already in the family of sex education. But for those of us who are, that's not our content, that's not our discipline, I am much of the mindset that you better believe the sexual lives of my students um, is something that is, that is of my interest and of my particular um, kind of, sense of, 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 of kind of wanting to support, mainly because if, I, if, if my students are not feeling safe sexually and emotionally and physically, they're, they're not going to feel safe in my classroom. I'm going to show you the voices of two students. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> pues, yo diría que, pues se tendría que tomar como como que los directores y los profesores y en general los alumnos tendrían que tomarlo como ay, ay, no. ay deja de burlarte este así como si nada y tomarlo como si fuera cualquier cosa no no tomarle atención ni mirarlos observar así como si fuera algo raro pues ajá uh -huh. ya hablé es que no estaba pensando perdón Ajá, y también de parte de los compañeros, ¿no? Entre nosotros mismos apoyarnos. ¿no? O como dice ella, ¿no? O Saberlos a todos por, por igual. Y no, tratar de no tener conflictos, ¿no? Entre nosotros mismos, los mismos grupos de LGBT. Tratar de llevarnos una, la fiesta en paz y, y relajado, ¿no? Todo sería como un ambiente más óptimo para todos nosotros. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I show you this video um, mainly also to bring them into the room in some way, but also because um, Andrea, or Abby, excuse me, said something very interesting. One of the things she says, I asked them, um, what suggestions would you have for your peers and for your teachers about how to make schools inclusive for LGBT youth? And Abby actually said something very interesting. She said, actually, I'd like for, LG, for our own peers to not show, for us to actually get along um, and not show internalized homophobia towards each other. Um, and I think that is actually something that we need to be mindful of as educators, regardless of, of sex educators or not, 
which is that in what ways are students already walking in with internalized notions of homophobia and internalized notions of transphobia and perpetuating it upon, within their own peer groups, their own LGBT queer um, uh, peer groups, and what are the ways in which we keep talking about, uh, you know, straight, you know, we keep telling the straight kids, hey, we need to be more inclusive of all of all gender and sexual identities, but we also need to be addressing LGBT youth and saying, let's address internalized homophobia, let's address internalized transphobia, and really have that conversation as an affinity group. So that was their vision for change. I also gave some uh, recommendations at the end of this particular project. Um, particularly around professional development for the faculty in a school of over 5,000 um, and uh, over 200 faculty, there were definitely there's definitely a deficit in terms of um, really uh, understanding these issues on a, on a larger level, especially in relation to the uh, just knowing the difference between gender and sexuality, understanding bullying and harassment. The counseling department, I was able to meet with them as well, um, did not have much background or training on, on uh, LGBT issues and LGBT youth. Comprehensive sex education was definitely non-existent. Um, I also emphasized to them that their, that their work needed to be much more intersectional, that it had to address gender and sexuality and as well as class and, and kind of cultural um, uh, kind of conditions as well. Uh, a lot of the students I spoke to either came from very upper wealthy back class backgrounds or um, poor uh, working class backgrounds. Um, and so that actually happened a lot with the couples. There's this particular couple, for example, here that I interviewed. Um, both of them came from across, they were a cross-class relationship and they talked a lot about how their socioeconomic backgrounds affected their relationship as young gay men. Um, and so uh, enumerated policies, engaging the, uh, the administration and understanding what enumerated policies are, um, addressing gender and sexual identity within their school climate um, policies, and then parent education. They already had a parent education group, and I suggested to their director um, to add this portion. So what happened was that Fulbright wound up expanding my entire world. That, that was in 2011. And since then, my entire life has changed. Um, and I have basically been able to ex um, go around the world, literally, and sharing my work in places like Argentina, India, the UK, and really being able to engage with other feminist and queer teachers around the world, including one particular convening that was brought together by GLSEN and UNESCO that brought together LGBT activists and researchers really for the first time in Buenos Aires to share their work, and I was the only teacher in the room. And just uh, there, this, this particular um, portrait, is, this is just a sampling of some of the countries that were represented. Um, but there were over 20 countries at this particular convening, and I just wanted to just sample to you what's being done around the world. And I, and I share this because the whole idea of safe schools and the safe schools movement, I do think that we tend to think of it as a very kind of US-based phenomenon. Um, GLSEN does such excellent work. They have such excellent research. Um, but in actuality, um, this work is, the Safe Schools Movement is actually global. Um, and there's so many countries, researchers, activists, teachers, who are doing this on the ground. And I think that when we think about even your work as sex educators, I'm sure you also know that sex education is happening on a much broader level. But myself as a teacher, I have to connect my local work to this global movement. In Brazil, there's um, a, a, an organization, not an organization, there's a research group called CLAM um, that is, has a, a program called Diversity in Schools, and they have a, a, an intersectional approach of doing sex ed and LGBT inclusive um, trainings for teachers that take into account not only gender and sexuality, but race and class. Um, in China, there's also a group called iBuy, which is working on LGBT inclusive sex ed um, with professors and, and teachers. In Ireland, there's an organization called Belong To, which offers a lot of uh, support to youth on the ground. They do excellent PSAs. Um, and amongst other things, they also offer support to LGBT refugees and asylum seekers. In Slovenia, Slovenia, they have a human rights education um, program for teachers as well. 
um, in South Africa. They, um, you know, like Mexico, words like queer, uh, terms like coming out, those are not necessarily terms that are being used in South Afri in some South African communities. So they're, they're translating and transforming their LGBT teacher trainings that, that, to make them much more um, culturally responsive and appropriate for the context that they're in. And this is in particular at the University of KwaZulu uh, Natal. So out of all of this global work that I've been doing, I've been able to bring it back to my classroom. And I started the talk with um, addressing how I do a lot of feminist teacher work. And I've been able to bring back this global perspective back into my New York City um, classroom. I'm going to show you a video um, uh, that was recently made of my students and myself and some of the things that we talk about in relation to feminist work that we do in the classroom, things like street harassment, sexual harassment, hyper-masculinity, um, racism. These are the topics of my feminism class. And I, I'm, I'm going to let my students speak for, for themselves as they share what they're learning in this class. Feminism should not be like put on a different level. It should have just as much importance as the rest of the fights for, for justice. Ever since I was about nine years old, I've been catcalled and street harassed. Miss! Miss! Yo, I'm talking to you. One time I really remember is I was with my sister and there was this probably 25 year old guy sitting on a bike and he just kept looking at me and I felt so powerless. Obviously living, living in New York City, catcalling, is something that I face nearly every single day. Your dress is always the same. Well, what were you wearing? Never ask a woman that. My name is Ileana Jimenez, and I'm a feminist teacher at Elizabeth Irwin High School. For my own purposes, as a queer woman of color in the, in the classroom, all these things inform who I am. And I can't separate that out when I walk into the classroom. Two of my closest friends tease me regularly for being in a feminism class. Everyone should consider themselves a feminist because if you're not a feminist, you just don't understand what, the, what feminism really is. What most people don't understand about feminism is that it's not like an attack on men, but it's just like this fight for, for fairness and equality, which is something that everyone should have. When I'm not in school, usually I am doing school sports, soccer, basketball, or I'm in the play. If you've ever been oppressed or if you've ever been discriminated against because of something you identify with or something you identify as, then you should definitely look into feminism. If you ask a thousand different feminists uh, what their definition of feminism is, you'll get a thousand different answers. I am a feminist and the class is making me a better person, it's making me an ally, and it's making me more conscious of the things that I say and do. Those are really personal stories where they're just putting themselves out there and the purpose of the class, the mission of the class, to give them an answer. What makes Ileana's teaching style unique is that she makes everything personal, so it's easy to relate to things that we talk about in class. But her, it's really she comes to you and she cannot be more interested and devoted to what she's doing. Like, beyond being a teacher, she is a feminist and she's just trying to, like, really share these messages she couldn't care more about. It's a class where you can speak your mind and you won't get judged for it by anyone else. Now, after taking this class, I feel a lot of confidence with saying something back to the people. This is what it means to be a feminist, which is that you're going to encounter obstacles. You're going to encounter these moments where you have to actually stand up for what you believe in. I believe that the key ingredient to being a good feminist is uh, love. I see young people saying, I took this class, now I'm going to do something. It could be as, as simple as creating a bulletin board or stopping yourself from being a bystander and actually intervening. I like to think that in a given situation, in a very serious situation, I wouldn't be a bystander. Not a lot of men are violent, but most men are silent. Both the academic piece and the activist issue pieces need to be a part of schools. Um, and I think if we did that, K through 12, I think we would live in a very different world. There's a lot, that particular class is taught in a very interdisciplinary way. I'm an English teacher, but in that course, I'm doing English, history, art history, media, blogging, activism. Um, I want my students to see the faces of feminism, the, the different manifestations of feminism. It's not a feminism class, it's a feminisms class. And I, I, I also don't want, uh, I don't want them to only know me. I don't want to be the only feminists that they know throughout their lives, and so I bring in a lot of speakers um, into the classroom 
um, from different, kind of, both in academia and activism, um, kind of various different partners who come into the classroom, because I do want them to see that there are different ways to do this work. Um, I also bring in men. I have never not had boys in this class. Um, I've been teaching it since the fall of 2008. And I don't know if some of you may have seen a video that went viral over the summer of um, eight boys who, uh, who had taken the course over the course of two years with me. Um, and they basically made a video about what it meant to take a feminism class in high school. And it wound up kind of going viral. And um, part of what I think the power of that video was is that boys really do connect to feminism um, when you provide the language that it is relevant to them. And many of my students are learning the language primarily, really, the one thing I want them to work away with is intersectionality. I want them to know that this is not just about gender. Um, it's also about sexuality, race, class, ethnicity. It's about intersecting forms of oppression. It's about intersecting forms of systemic oppression. We just had a very powerful assembly yesterday on Ferguson, and one of my students stood up and said, this is also about young women and girls of color, and um, the boys agreed who had taken the class, the boys from this particular video. Um, and so it, it's... This particular course for me is my passion work. It's my heart work. And I've been able, I've, I have felt lucky enough to bring it um, in, in a kind of miniature form to a more global scale. And when I do it on a global scale, I actually don't bring any content from my class to, I, I went on a tour of India recently, and I had no intention of bringing my content uh, from my class to India because I don't want to perpetuate, I already have a colonized mind um, from being a, a, a Puerto Rican um, queer feminist teacher. I'm not about to impose my curriculum on another context and culture. But instead what I did was that I worked collaboratively with teachers in India to create the feminist classroom and content that they wanted and, and that, they, that they worked collaboratively with me on. So as a part of that tour, I went to uh, schools in Delhi and Calcutta and Lucknow and Mumbai, <coughs> excuse me, and I also visited with various NGOs working on queer and feminist issues. One of the schools that I visited was this, a school called the Tagore International School in Delhi, which is the first school in India to have a, a GSA. And this is huge. This is, I mean, India just reinstated the Indian Penal Code 377, which made homosexuality um, a, 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 basically a crime. And in the, in the face of that, this school said, no, we're going we're gonna to start this GSA. We're going to get trained by CREA, which is a global, international, feminist, queer human rights group. And the students train their teachers. They train their peers. They created a documentary. They did all these things. And so I met with them one day while I was in Delhi. And I spent a couple of hours and I said, you know what, wouldn't it be great if you could all meet my students? And they said, yes. And I thought, this is it. This is where we can find the sweet spot of how to bring young people together along feminist and queer and intersectional work that is multi-issue, that is youth-led, that is interdisciplinary, that is intersectional, that is all that allows for teachers such as myself and my colleague Shivani to do work together, for them to create media together, um, to do things like Twitter, to go on retreats together. That's exactly what they did when they came to visit. Um, I'm going to show you a video of this particular GSA. I'm really proud that our students have taken up the project on uh, bringing awareness about the LGBTQI community and trying to give a human angle or touch to it. And the way our students have taken to this project understood the complexities. Lesbian, gay and bisexual, these are types of uh, sexual orientation. Very happy that our students are doing something different, something constructive, something good for the society. 
When we started this project, our main aim was to create an environment that is inclusive towards the LGBTQI community. And the principle that we worked on was to spread awareness about them and um, tell people about the stigma that they face in our society. Uh, this is our library section that we've created in our senior library. It contains books regarding the LGBTQI community and some informative books and brochures. So this is our complaint box so students can submit any complaint regarding any kind of violence to visit regarding their sexual orientation that they face and our counsellor will be to the matter and solve the problem. This is our notice board that chronicles LGBTQI news. We update it every month with news and um, it's done by our art team which takes care of it. And this is our support flag that students made for this project. As a Tego International School policy, we train our students to be pioneers. We train them to think outside the box. That is what we are proud of. And we took this up because we knew nobody else would. It will be very beneficial in changing, you know, the way that society uh, feels about the LGBT community. After that session which we had with them, uh, we were uh, quite clear with the concept of LGBTQI. I appreciate the fact that it's a very conservative topic which people normally generally don't talk about. There were like normal people and I don't think there's any need to discriminate against them and we need to live uniformly like a homogeneous society. I came to know quite a few things and yes, after seeing it, I think uh, I felt like uh, joining the project. I felt like being part of the project. When I went home on the dinner table at night, I explained all this to my mother also who asked day to day what I did in school and she was really impressed and asked me to be a part of this campaign and now I'm in the art section of the campaign with him. I think it's incredible that young people are getting involved in these kind of issues and wanting to do something about this um, because I think respect is a very learned behaviour. All of us need to learn to respect and to respect differences which at the best of times can be difficult and especially when we see someone who's different or from from the from what we consider to be the norm we tend to look down on them um, but what what we need to realize is that um, they have the same feelings and um, they need to feel the same way that we want to feel about ourselves since i came out in my school i'm actually very proud of what they're doing for people like me I thought we would just stop it there. Um, as you can see, they, they've been doing so much work at the school in just under a year. They have marched in the Delhi Pride Parade. They have trained their teachers and their peers. They have created this documentary. Um, they have basically plastered their entire school with uh, various posters. Um, they have a whole library section with LGBT um, content and books. I mean, that's a lot of work for one GSA to be doing um, for the first time. You can't even get most GSAs in the U.S. to do that amount of work. Um, and I just, I was so impressed by them. Um, I'm going to move to the next slide. So as a result of being so inspired um, by what, their, what Tagore International School is doing, Shivani and I decided to, to create the first global partnership on LGBT and feminist issues in schools. And what we did was we basically invited um, her students to come to my school. And what we did was we wanted to create a partnership that allowed them to do activism on the ground, as well as com uh, have conversations about feminist and queer issues that they thought were pertinent to their lives. Um, and as a result of that, we were able to bring in groups like Breakthrough, um, which I, I don't know if you know of this group, but Breakthrough is based in both Delhi and New York, and they work on issues of gender-based violence. They also have a campaign called um, Be That Guy, hashtag Be That Guy, and they engage young men and boys on how to stop gender-based violence, which a lot of my uh, uh, boys in my class really took to. Um, and as a part of this particular um, collaboration, you can see the students from India kind of scattered in, the, in, in, my, in my classroom with my students. Um, they spent about a week and a half with my students. About four of them came. And in that week and a half, we talked about the Delhi gang rape. We talked about um, a play called Nirbaya, which I had seen in London that 
feature the Delhi gang rape as, a, as an important part of, of, the, of the story. And I, one of the stars of that show um, is a woman named Purna Jagannathan. And she came to actually visit my class to talk about the play. And my classroom was the first in the world to read this text alongside students from India and to have a conversation together in the same room, which is really quite revolutionary. The students from Delhi were sharing how they themselves had felt when the Delhi gang rape had happened, how they had gone to protests, how they, how they had gone to vigils. My students talked about how they have been a part of um, various kind of uh, sexual harassment, sexual assault, um, and you know, gender-based violence work here in, in the US. So this was really quite an intense week of conversations, not only about um, gender-based violence, but also about the LGBT work that uh, Breaking Barriers in India is doing. Uh, they put together an assembly uh, for International Day of the Girl where they put together skits on bystander intervention, on domestic violence, on rape, on slut shaming, um, on a whole host of issues that both the Indian students and my students felt were important to share with the entire school community. And finally, I think for teachers like myself to be able to do work that is akin to the type of work that you are all doing, it really needs to be intersectional. It really needs to uh, take into account all these different forms of identity and systemic um, racism, sexism, classism, homophobia, transphobia. It needs to be interdisciplinary. I'm trained as a literature teacher, but I have gone outside of my field in order to be a better and innovative and much more cutting edge educator. Um, it has to be intergenerational. We need to share the wisdom uh, across the ages. I loved the dedication to, to Terry earlier. Um, that kind of, those conversations are priceless. Um, it has to be, and this time, local as well as national and global. It has to be multi-issue. My students are facing, uh, a, lot, a, a number of my students who take my classes are undocumented, they're, or they're facing poverty or they are, come from single parent homes. Um, all of those issues are, are, for me, feminist issues. And they need to be media makers. They need to contribute to the larger conversation. The, the, the blog, there's a blog that comes out of my class called F to the Third Power, and I want my students to contribute to the online conversation that's happening around them. Um, and teachers need to be a part of this. We can't let we always talk a lot about empowering youth, but we also need to empower teachers. And we need to make sure that teachers are seen as public leaders, as public intellectuals, as leaders who know what they're doing um, and, that, and who are experts in their field. So I, I leave you with this, my vision. Um, which is that in order to create safe schools, we need to do all of these things together or we won't really be doing social justice for anyone. Thank you. I am open to questions and answers. I know it went on for a while. I actually cut short the, the video from, from India um, only because I didn't know whether it was going too long or not for you, but um, I am open to questions and answers. Hi, I loved your, your speech. It was just Amazing. Thank you. My question is, how long the students meet with you? Do they meet once a week, twice a week? Um, is it solely in your classroom, or is there after school groups, things like that? Great question. Um, this is a course that I teach um, four times a week. For this, this particular class, is, I, have, I, have a, I have a full load of English classes. This is just one class that I teach four times a week. Um, and uh, it's an elective. So everyone who's taking it wants to be there. It's mixed juniors and seniors together, um, which I really like. 
Um, I like that juniors are learning from seniors and seniors are learning from juniors. You don't really get to see that very often um, in, in classrooms. So that's, that's, that's the kind of logistic of that. But what I've loved is that out of the feminism class came a feminism club. Um, usually it's the reverse. Usually it's like, we have this club, we, we need a class. Um, but a uh, student who had taken the class with me last year as juniors said, well, what are we gonna do with seniors? So they created a club. And actually the, there's a little clip of their bulletin board where they, have, they call it the wall of women. And they included all these women, women of color, trans women, um, women from all different kinds of fields. And they created this wall of women to basically say, we're starting this club, come to our club. It's not, it's, it's a feminist club, but it's also a club. By the way, they all want to talk about sex education. So if you want to come visit the feminism club and be a guest speaker, please do so. Or if you want to be a guest speaker in my class, feminism class, please do so. But yes, the class and the club are, the club is once a week after school. The class is four times a week for, 40, for 45, 50 minutes. Yes, for a trimester. It's not year long, I wish it were. Yes, I have a question. Have you done this presentation at teachers' conferences? Um, I actually have not done it for a lot of teacher conferences. I've done it for like local schools who have invited me. My next step is to do it at teacher conferences. I've done it a lot at academic conferences. Um, and so I, I think that I think what you're about to say is that I need to do it at con teacher conferences. Yes, um, especially in Nevada. We, are, we have been fighting for conference success for years and our teachers are still living in, I don't know what age is. I have a card Thank you. that I can I hope you. I didn't offend any teachers here, but yes. I'd love to do it in Nevada. Um, you're right, I do, I, this is something actually I've been talking a lot about with my partner and we're both teachers and um, I reached this point in my career where I had gotten a lot out of teacher conferences, and then I started to diversify it, um, you know, kind of like when they talk about retirement accounts. And I, I was like, um, I thought, well, let me diversify the type of conferences I go to. Um, and I kind of stopped going to teacher-only conferences. I started going to like media conferences and feminist conferences and women's studies conferences and sex education conferences. I started going to conferences that were not in my field anymore. And I, I, I did that because I started to reach just like the stopping point of learning. And I wanted to continue learning. And the only way to do that was to say, I'm gonna to go to a conference that is not related to what I do, but it is related to what I do. Because everything I do in the classroom is related to this. Um, but yes, I, I do need to circle back to going back to only teacher conferences. Um, I think what you're doing is fabulous. I work uh, at a school where we had extremely at-risk youth. Mm. Um, poverty, um, we're worried about our kids staying alive. So <clears throat> to introduce sex ed has been very difficult because that's the very last thing that they're thinking about. But to take it to the next level and really become more inclusive and LGBTQ oriented when faculty is not, what would your advice be for someone like myself where I see my students wanting it, needing it, but my faculty, it's falling on deaf ears. Mm. And I mean, we service um, approximately 12,500 and I am the only sex educator for sixth through 12th grade. Wow. Um, who are your allies? You're so far behind. Um, our agency has been around for 33 years, and mm. this is the first year that they've implemented a full-time uh, sex education teacher. We have no LGBTQ. Our staff is afraid to come out. And I identify as queer, and I am a woman, and I am biracial, and I am working in an environment where all of those things are, are battles uphill. Mm. So how do we... Ch I'm, here in, I'm here in New York. Um, so find me, okay? <laughs> um, but how do we, ch it's, the, it's the administration. 
It's the, where is our funding coming from? And because the funding comes from somewhere that doesn't, you know, honor sexuality in all its forms, how do we change that and say this is necessary? Mm. Um, I'm remembering when I wanted to start uh, the conversation on trans issues at my school. And um, initially, I was met with a lot of resistance. Um, and I thought, OK. I, I, I had this attitude of like, I'm going to be the lone ranger. I'm going to be the one who does this by herself. And I realized that that was actually um, not the right approach. And uh, my principal said to me, look, I'm kind of on your page, kind of. Um, can you get other teachers to kind of agree with you and be a committee with you? Because you're kind of crazy. And um, I had to get other people, other teachers, to get in line and have a, a, basically form a committee with me. And it was by forming that committee that uh, the school nurse, for example, wound up being an ally I had not anticipated. And she said, uh, Ileana, you know, I've read uh, various things about um, trans issues, and, I, and let, let's get this book um, that we can get the faculty to read. And I was like, great, the school nurse is on my side. Um, and so, I actually, again, to use the word diversify, I had to kind of st step outside who I thought were going to be my allies um, and create a coalition and a committee. And then once I did that, I, cre I actually wrote a grant and I implemented a year-long series of assemblies on gender and sexuality. And I'm gonna give you my whole thing, which is that I had a um, keynote speaker come in, his name was Don McPherson, and he talks a lot about gender-based violence. He's a former NFL football player. He identifies as a feminist. He used to be on the board of the Ms. Foundation. And he was our keynote. And the reason what, what I wound up doing was I, I created a year-long series on gender and sexuality for the entire school. And my whole goal, though, underneath it was I want to be trans-inclusive. But the only way to get people on board was to talk about gender. Right? So that keynote speaker um, talked about how he was an African-American NFL straight football player who was a feminist. And then we had a trainer come in for the faculty on trans inclusion. Then we had that same trainer do an assembly for the kids. And I'll never forget the morning that, of that assembly. My principal called me into her office and said, Ileana, we're going to have to cancel this. And I said, the trainers are coming today. We've already hired them. They're coming in an hour. This is not appropriate. The kids are not going to get it. I said, the kids are going to totally get it. It's the, it's the adults, right? The adults are not going to get so-called get it. But at, I said, look, they are professionals. And they wound, there were a number of people who pulled me aside and Liana, you're crazy. We're not ready for this. And this is a small downtown progressive hippy dippy school. And um, finally, uh, they did do the assembly. And two years later, we admitted um, two of our first transgender students, at least who were, who were out and identifying as transgender. A few years after that, our first transgender alum came back, trans woman alum, and I asked her, I said, do you remember that, that series of assemblies we did? What grade were you in? She said, I was in ninth grade when that happened. And I said, did you identify at all with that year? And she said, yeah, I'm so glad that that happened. It allowed me to come out much later, but I'm glad that it did. And you know, there was one teacher who said to me, why do I, as a math teacher, need to know about trans issues? And I said, you definitely need to know about trans issues as a math teacher. Um, and so I, I, it's not the same, but it is the same, because we have to create coalitions with people. 
And we have to, sometimes it's people who you don't expect. The school nurse I thought was a very conservative person, but she wound up being so open-minded and so much more progressive than I had assumed she was. So having her on my side was crucial. Sometimes there are people who can be your allies who are completely unexpected. So that's the only thing I can suggest is create a small coalition, start meeting, organizing, and then build that. That's the only thing I can suggest right now. Thank you so much. You've been really fantastic. And I just want to thank again the ASL um, interpreters. They've been working extremely hard um, throughout this entire um, evening and throughout the week. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.